I hope you all are enjoying the morning. I hope you agree that this has been a fabulous lineup of speakers, very diverse, but yet very tied together. As we all know, the markets and the economy and all the things that go into it are tied together. I think all of us would agree, as we've seen with you, our clients, that investing in a meaningful way is important, but it also applies to investing in philanthropy. When you support people or causes that are important to you, you wanna make sure that you are making an impact and that you're actually helping the causes and the people that you intend to. Uh, we as a firm also believe that. And as, as part of our, as I mentioned our mission, one of the reasons, one of the missions around Six Meridian is for us as a company to be able to invest in our people and in our community in ways that are meaningful to us. Part of that is we have, we have our supporters of Stand Together and the Go Create campaign, which uh, ties closely to Evan Feinberg. Evan is the executive director of Stand Together Foundation, an organization that breaks barriers, improving, improving lives, and transforming communities. The Stand Together Foundation is part of the broader Stand Together philanthropic community. Prior to joining Stand Together Foundation, Evan served as the president of Generation Opportunity and as a program manager for the Charles Cook Institute. In 2012, Evan became one of the first millennials to run for the US Congress in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Earlier in his career, Evan served as a senior aide to U.S. Senators Rand Paul and Tom Coburn. His wife, Sarah, is a former U officer in the U.S. Marine Corps and a veteran of the Iraq War. They have three boys, Luke, Zach, and Jake. Evan is going to talk with us for a few minutes about transforming philanthropy. Philanthropy. I knew I was going to miss it. The courage and the courage to do things differently. And after that, he will be joined on stage with, by Chase Koch, the president of Co Disrupted Co Technologies, and Christina Long, the CEO of Create Campaign. Welcome, Evan. All right. Well, good afternoon. What an incredible group of people, and I am so thrilled and honored to get to be able to talk to you today about philanthropy, and as you, can, as you can see, it's about transforming philanthropy. On the program, I think it said entrepreneurial philanthropy. So I wanna to talk to you today about what needs to be different, what's broken, what's wrong right now, that I hope this group of incredible business leaders, investors, influencers, that's coming together today to talk about how to think about ideas about not only investing, but your philanthropy, that if this group adopts a different paradigm, a different set of mental models, that I really believe it could transform the entire culture here in Wichita around how our communities operate, and I think be an example for the entire country. So let's start with what's wrong with how philanthropy is done today. What's broken about what I call the social sector today? Today we have uh, hundreds of billions of dollars spent in philanthropy all over the country. It's as much as $400 billion a year are spent to do things like break the cycle of poverty, address issues like addiction and other social barriers. If you add in the government's war on poverty, another trillion plus is going toward that. We are spending so much time, talent, and treasure. But the problem is, is that we do very little to understand the customer of those investments, of whether or not individual people that are facing social barriers in their lives are actually improving their lives as a result of all of those dollars. We take a control mentality that we think we know best how to solve their problems. We spend very little time and energy to understand what they need, want, and desire, and whether or not the things that we're doing actually improve their lives as they see it. So it's gotten us predictably bad results. There are 40 plus million Americans in poverty today. That poverty line hasn't really budged in five or six decades. Social mobility in this country, which is one of the hallmarks of the American dream, has been on the decline relative to historical standards. In America today, even before the pandemic, life expectancy was on the decline in our country. It's shocking to me. Deaths of despair during COVID in particular, up 30%. We've got a mental health crisis in our communities, particularly our low-income communities. This stuff is life or death for people in our communities, for our neighbors, for those around us. 
And it's all a result of all of this well-intentioned, uh, extremely uh, significant efforts that are happening in our communities, taking this control mentality, trying to fix people like they're broken and deficient and need top-down expert help to solve their problems. So I'd like to suggest today that this group right here can lead a bottom-up revolution here in Wichita to transform how philanthropy is done so that it is focused on empowering those from the bottom up, helping each and every person to tap into their unique gifts and talents to contribute, and together we can build a new social economy, a new social sector in Wichita that drives that kind of transformation. So that's all pretty abstract. I want to share a couple of stories from the work that I get to do. Um, but first, let me just say a bit more about who I am and, and what we do at Stand Together. So my name is Evan Feinberg. I'm the executive director at Stand Together Foundation. It's part of the broader philanthropic community founded by Charles Koch, known as Stand Together, that addresses barriers across all of the major institutions in society, education, business, government, and communities. I lead the work to transform communities all over the country. And what does it mean to have a robust and strong civil society and social sector that empowers people? Uh, and so we've gone around the country searching for the very best social entrepreneurs who are discovering new and better ways to meet the needs of individuals in their communities and helping those organizations to grow, scale, replicate, and have a greater impact in their work. And so I've gotten this incredible opportunity to draw some insights from the hundreds of nonprofits that we work with that I'd love to be able to share with you today. So the, a couple of those stories that I mentioned. We first met a group called The Phoenix about six years ago, led by my good friend Scott Strode. And we were doing a, I was doing a site visit. It was the first time I was in their gym. I was up in Boston, Massachusetts. And I walk in the door, and they're treating me like I was one of their clients walking in the door, which means I needed to be 48 hours clean and sober to step into the gym. And within really five minutes of stepping into the doors, I'm in a harness ready to climb up a climbing wall with my instructor, Sean. So Sean, he's this amazing coach. And Sean starts to, you know, I'm not a climber, so he's teaching me like what to do, you know, climb with your legs, not your hands, you know, things like that. And, uh, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself because I scurry right up the easy wall and he takes me to a harder one and he's coaching me more to get up. And I get to the top of that one, he takes me to a harder one, I didn't get to the top of that one. Um, but I get down to the bottom and Sean begins to tell me his story. It turns out that that day was the 10th anniversary of Sean's sobriety. So Sean says, he starts telling me this is 10 years today uh, since I last had a drink or used a drug. And all of a sudden, people from around this gym, because the Phoenix is a peer-to-peer -peer recovery program through the power of physical fitness, people from around the gym start coming over to Sean, and there's high fives and hugs and even tears. And Sean tells uh, me the rest of his story. He was at rock bottom, uh, nearly to the point of taking his own life. He did not believe that he had anything to contribute or to offer. Then he came into the Phoenix and he learned how to climb. And first it was the self-efficacy that he could get from the bottom of that rock face to the top that began to help him believe in himself again. But then it turns out that Sean was particularly good at helping others to do it too. He's helping those that he's climbing next to. He's kind of teaching them what he's learning and he starts helping others to get to the top and have that same feeling. And he finds out that he's actually a pretty darn good climber and he's an even better teacher, better coach. So then Sean then becomes a volunteer coach at the Phoenix and then ultimately became a climbing instructor as his job. And now he trains all of the climbing instructors all over the country for the Phoenix, which is now a recovery movement with over 100,000 members all over the country, and in fact, a location right here in Wichita that we'll talk about more in a bit. So Sean has this incredible story. He is what he would say better than well and living up to his full potential, and his addiction is very much in his rearview mirror, and he's using his experience to improve so many more lives. And it strikes me when, you, when I think about Sean's story, this really important part of it, that Sean is not just good at what he does, He's, in the, he's the best in the world at what he does. There's nobody that I can think of that could be a recovery coach teaching people to climb and inspiring people to overcome their addiction 
through that sport than Sean. And so we need to start rethinking the very nature of the, of the people that we're trying to serve and start seeing people for Sean for their strengths and their assets and their ability to self-actualize rather than see Sean for his brokenness, for his deficiency, for his problems that we believe we can solve from the outside. It will fundamentally reshape how we, how we serve and support someone like Sean. And so I tell you this story for a very important reason. If you were to look up addiction recovery solutions in academic journals, and if you were to go by the way that philanthropy does things today, you would go look for evidence-based best practices, a model that has been demonstrated to work, and you would try to replicate that model with more people. This is how government evidence-based policy making happens. It's how most of philanthropy is done, this sort of effective altruism angle or scale what works model. You figure out the model that works and you replicate it over and over again. And of course, that might sound better than the alternatives. Too much of philanthropy is based on good intentions rather than actually solving problems. We can't have that either. Right? You can't just use counting metrics to understand how many coats you've donated or meals you've served or beds that somebody has utilized. That doesn't really help you to know, are you truly transforming lives as people define it for themselves? But even still, we have to go beyond this idea that some experts can study a problem and push out the answers that they've learned to solve that problem. I think Sean's story demonstrates that as powerfully as anyone that I know. So I could tell many more stories like this. I'd love to share with you another organization called Safe Families for Children, where if you look up all of the sort of studies on child welfare, everyone's trying to figure out how do we develop better foster care and adoption practices to improve child welfare. As it turns out, 70 to 80% of cases that go into the foster care system are for neglect, not abuse. And while much of that neglect is in fact abuse, Many of those cases are parents who love their children, deeply want to provide for them, but face circumstances that prevent them from doing so. Instead of trying to come up with a model to solve that problem, Safe Families for Children created the novel concept that relationships can outcompete programs and services for those families. What if a family, when they are in that moment of crisis, had relationships to help support them? Maybe to buy a refrigerator when the refrigerator goes bad so that they don't lose their kids to the system because they couldn't provide nutritious food. Or maybe it was a parent who needed addiction recovery services and needed to go into treatment for 30 or 60 days or longer and needed temporary hosting for their child on a voluntary basis rather than coerced by the state. So Safe Families built that model in the first state that they were active in Illinois. They helped drive culture change that brought the number of kids in foster care from 52,000 down to 17,000 in just 15 years while the rest of the country was going up. Because they changed the culture around child welfare rather than just doing a single program that people could replicate. They changed the way every investigator thought about their job Right? How every school that was making a phone call to child welfare services thought about the people that they were serving. That kind of culture change is what we believe we're after in philanthropy. So I share those two stories. The Phoenix and Safe Families both happen to be national organizations that are operating right here in Wichita. But I don't tell you about those two because I want you to support the Phoenix or support the Safe, Fam Safe Families alone. Right? It would be fantastic if there are opportunities to partner on that. But it's because I want you to take these as examples of how we might together think differently about a philanthropic ecosystem here in Wichita that tackles problems from the bottom up rather than the top down. So we're going to do a panel in a second here, but I want to offer three things that I think could be pr uh, pretty critical to changing that that I'd like to talk about with our panelists, and they're going to share more about some of these example, examples of really disruptive and transformative efforts that are happening here in Wichita. But these three things that I think need to be thought about differently, that if I could get the very best and most innovative and forward-thinking philanthropists in Wichita to think about differently, I believe we'd change the culture here in the city. The first is that nonprofit organizations 
in this, in this community and across the country have to adopt a different set of principles and values about the work that they're doing. They have to do it. This philosophy that I've described about empowerment versus control, in every conversation that you have with every nonprofit that you're a part of, with every charitable or philanthropic group that you're a part of, you have to help them think about the people they serve through the principles of dignity, a deep belief in the people they serve, through the principles of empowerment, that they have to think about how to, in, to inspire that each individual to tap into their gifts and talents to, to overcome their problems in their life. And by, by focusing on discovery, we need new and better ways discovered from the bottom up, right? The, the practice of social entrepreneurship cannot be a matter of doing what we think works. It needs to be discovering from our customers what works. So I'd love for you to help drive a transformation in the principles that animate this work. Those principles then need to animate how nonprofits manage themselves differently. You can't have an organization that sees themselves as doing sort of second rate, nice work, an agency that just pushes out services. No, you need to inspire nonprofit organizations here to be social entrepreneurs that are empowering their staff to discover new and better ways to meet the needs of their customers, meet the needs of the people they serve. We need the same kind of entrepreneurship that happens in for-profits and businesses all over the country to happen in every single nonprofit. I hear all too often nonprofits say, I'd like to work myself out of business, right? Like I, I would know, like my services would no longer be needed. You never hear for-profit companies say that. They say, well, if, my, if I can creatively destroy my product, I'll develop the next set of products that my customers need. That's what we need in nonprofits as well. And then finally, and I'm really excited, Pete's here from United Way, and we're doing some really exciting work together. Um, I believe that we need to disrupt and transform measurement in this sector. Instead of top-down measures that just give us a snapshot of whether something's working or not, or worse, counting up how many services we've rendered, we need a measurement methodology that understands from the customer whether their life has been transformed. We're pioneering along with Pete and his team at the United Way and their 211 systems, uh, with, the, with Ron McMahon and the YMCA here, and a number of nonprofits, a measurement methodology that patterns after customer service businesses to go ask customers the degree to which a service has transformed their life, whether they'd recommend it to somebody else, whether they have become empowered to overcome barriers in their life. We have an entire methodology that we believe we can compare apples to apples across nonprofits, help everyone from individuals experiencing poverty to nonprofits, to funders to begin making better decisions. So I'd love to, to dig into all of that, but let me tell you just a couple of things about what we're doing here in Wichita, and then I'll invite Chase and Christina up to go a lot deeper on these things. Stand Together Foundation is making investments alongside many of the, the key leading philanthropists here in Wichita in a social entrepreneurship program where we've been going around and meeting many of the very best nonprofits here in Wichita We've selected them. Next month, we'll kick off a catalyst program to work with these social entrepreneurs on management and measurement and those principles that I described. We're investing in really exciting organizations like the Phoenix and Safe Families and Rising Tide Capital in their partnership with the Create Campaign that we believe could have a disruptive impact here in Wichita. Um, and we know that those efforts are just scratching the surface. And so a big part of why I'm here is to get connected to this incredible group to figure out what's next for those efforts. So if that's all exciting to you, I'd, I'd love to talk a whole lot more. So I've got a couple of panelists here that I think are on the leading edge of disrupting the philanthropic sector here in Wichita. A, a big part of this vision that I've described is, has been the work with, um, with not only our founder, Charles Koch, uh, but Chase has been a leading uh, innovator and disruptor in this philanthropic space. And so I'm gonna invite Chase up to the stage. Chase and Christy, you guys can come on up. Uh, Chase, the president of Coke Disruptive Technologies and a key leader for us at Stand Together. And then Christina Long, who is the founder and CEO of the Create Campaign, also a business leader in her own right in the community as well. Uh, and Christina and Stand Together Foundation are partnering with the Create Campaign and Rising Tide Capital as well. So thank you, welcome to our panelists. All right, I've, uh, I've, I'll pull out my questions here to make sure I uh, 
I don't remember what to ask you guys. Well, let's, softballs only. Yeah, softballs only. You got it. Well, Chase, let's go ahead and, and start with you then. Uh, I mentioned that you've been a key leader in uh, developing this strategy and these uh, principles that I shared. Um, maybe just start for us, why are you so passionate about solving the problems I just described and so passionate about this work? Well, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate the uh, Six Meridian team doing this. Uh, it's a very important subject for Wichita, and, and like Evan said, uh, this is, it's a big opportunity, I think, for this community. But why I'm so passionate is, I think, first of all, because uh, I've seen it work. And um, what you talked about with bottom-up solutions, this isn't just, um, you know, uh, I'm Charles Koch's son, so I've been, you know, I've had these ideas beaten into my head since I was three years old. That is true, by the way. <laughs> uh, but, but it's, you know, and, and honestly, being his son, I kind of, I push back like any good son would do. And like, what, what's, you know, we're in kind of theory land here. Does this really work? And, uh, you know, um, I was a skeptic, you know, um, and, uh, but when, until you see it uh, work and transform people's lives yourself, you're, you know, you, you don't have a full appreciation for the power of these ideas and specifically this one around bottom-up solutions where you actually find an entrepreneur, as you mentioned, like Scott Strode for the Phoenix, that has been through the actual problem and they understand it so deeply and it almost, you know, almost took their life. So when someone's back's against the wall, they understand, okay, I, I'm gonna die unless I figure out a different way, a better way, right? And when you see those stories um, take place, as opposed to someone at the top down that doesn't really understand the problem, um, but is telling people what to do, um, it, it's, it just, it, it all comes to life, right? And so these stories that, that you mentioned, and, I have several of my own that I can share as well of, of, um, of folks that I've been around where I've seen this. That is what works, right? And so I've seen those results with my own eyes and I've, I've been part of that. So, I mean, I think that's one reason. Uh, when you see results, it's, it's exciting. And I'd say because of that, I've really transformed like what I, what I work on and where I spend my time. As you, as you mentioned, spend more and more of my time with Stand Together. Um, because, um, you know, it just kind of breeds that passion in you when you see the impact on, on others, other people's lives. And so I'm trying to figure out, okay, where within this community can I create the most value? Where, where do I have the most passion? Um, so we can talk about specifically where, where those areas are. But just within the last, like, six or seven years, it's really um, transformed my life because I get to work on it. And then it makes you feel good because you see like what you're doing and you see the uh, specific folks that you're helping and you know them personally. I mean, it really changes the way you think about things. So I've had a, a number of uh, experiences like that. And, um, and then the last thing I'd say is Wichita specifically. I mean, I was born and raised here. I've lived here most of my life. I went away to school um, and then uh, moved to Austin, Texas, which, which I loved. But um, there, was, there was a pretty good opportunity to come back and, and learn uh, from my old man and other amazing executives at Coke. Um, so to really kind of get my career started back here. And I just realized after living in Dallas, living in Houston and, and uh, in Austin that, that Wichita was such an amazing place and that I yearned to, to come back to the culture and to the people and to the friendships that I've built since I was in preschool. Um, and there's a reason why Coke Industries has is is always stayed in Wichita, Kansas. And it's because of, of that culture. And while there's been amazing things happen on the philanthropic side, um, just what I've discovered through Stand Together and some of our efforts and these entrepreneurs we've found in other communities, that we, we can supercharge that here in Wichita. And there's such an opportunity um, uh, to do that. And we needed to figure out, okay, how do we really plug into this ecosystem in a more effective way and really build, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a virtuous cycle around uh, philanthropy where you see one thing work, whether it's the Phoenix or youth entrepreneurs or and pick, pick your organization, right? And then you see that why it works. And then it kind of infects others as well. And then you want to apply those same ideas to this organization, that organization, and pretty soon 
there's a, a bottom-up groundswell where you're really starting to make an impact and transform the community. So yeah. that, that's why I'm passionate about it. Yeah, I can't wait to get to you, Christina, but a quick follow-up, um, Chase. So I've, I've been with you and, and, um, and, and heard from you a number of your personal experiences with this work. So I, I gave a very abstract sort of what needs to happen in philanthropy, but sure. stories like the Phoenix and urban specialists, putting yeah. your finger in the, in, in the, you know, in the bullet holes in the side of the oh, building yeah. together. Tell me more about that. Yeah, no, I'll maybe share a couple stories. I'll try to be uh, uh, brief here, but um, the, I'll start with the one you just mentioned. Um, in Dallas, there's this wonderful group called um, Urban Specialists. And, um, and so I, I saw this one firsthand uh, when I was taken to basically, you know, the toughest neighborhood um, in Dallas in the South Side um, by a gentleman named Anton Lucky. I'll just give a little context for, for Anton. He's just like Scott Strode. He is a, um, I call him principal disruptive social entrepreneurs because they're coming at a problem with such a unique um, approach that no one has ever done before and really kind of changing the game. And Anton's quick backstory was at 15 years old, he was the, uh, the, he, he, he was the founder of the Bloods, the gangs, you know, you've heard of the, the Crips and the Bloods and whatnot. And, and he was the, the founder of that. And of course he got into a lot of trouble, ended up uh, getting thrown in prison uh, for, 13, 14 years, and um, he, uh, he it was discovered within prison by all his mates that, you know, this guy is a leader. I mean, if you can, if you can start an organization like the Bloods at 15 and be an effective leader, um, you know, he basically, he, he, um, you know, he ran into a pastor um, that convinced him, like, you are a leader. Are you, when you get out of here, are you going to lead to do bad? like what you had been doing? Or are you gonna take that leadership skill and lead to do good in the community? And so he went through his own personal transformation in prison and came out and, um, and, made a, and, and met a, a really good friend of, of Evan and, and mine, Omar uh, Jawar, who's uh, unfortunately passed away um, during COVID. Um, but he partnered up with, with Omar to create a group called Urban Specialists which was a group that was basically set up to disrupt gang violence. And basically, Anton's story, he had been through this before, that he was gonna create an organization of, uh, of other folks that have been through that and broken out of the gang violence uh, cycle and basically create this uh, organization that go door to door in the toughest neighborhoods where these kids don't have fathers and don't, don't have direction and show them a better path. And, and a guy like Anton Lucky has the credibility when he knocks on that door to transform someone's mind, right? And so I went and saw this, you know, uh, with my very own eyes in South, South Dallas with Evan and a few others. And uh, we, were, we were in the toughest neighborhood where they were saying there was a, a drive-by shooting about every week. Um, and so they dropped their office right in the heart of it. And so I planted a flag, urban specialist right there. And, um, and uh, Omar said, he's like, you see these holes right here? That's from a drive-by shooting about two weeks ago. He's like, put your finger in those holes, just to like really understand the levity of the situation here in Dallas. And so then I, we went in and uh, all these kids that have been pulled off the street are in there as the new urban specialists. And they're in there um, basically teaching me market-based management, the philosophy of Coke Industries, because um, Omar and Anton saw the power of the principles of MBM. Like, oh, we want to take those and, and, uh, and apply that to, um, to urban specialists because we have real core principles. We'll get more and more of these kids um, aligned to it. Um, and uh, the funny thing about it was they renamed it OGU, Original Gangster University. And I was like, I, we should change that at Coke. I kind of <laughs> like that name. Um, but... Uh, but I mean, it just like brought tears to your eyes because you have all these kids lined up that had just gotten pulled off the street and they all had their, they went, they all had one principle and they presented it to me and like what it means to them and how it's transformed their life. And like, and I was like, wow, God, you guys need to come to Coke and teach our people like how to apply. <laughs> it was really, really unbelievable. So, and Urban Specialists is, is one of these organizations, once again, bottom up, Anton Lucky, the founder, coming up with this model and now scaling that across the country. How many yeah. states are we in now? 
Uh, with Urban Specialists? Yeah, with Urban Specialists. Um, so there, I mean, we've done events and work in at least uh, 12 cities yeah. and, uh, and have operations in many of them, yeah. So Anton is a leader of that, and um, he, we're going to scale it with capital and the community that we have with Stand Together, and it's no different than the community we have in Wichita, right? Yeah. You have the power of community to get behind that. Um, just amazing things can happen, yeah. and you can scale it. Can I share one more story? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I don't want to take Christina's time, but it, um, um, I want to hit the Phoenix because that one is near and dear uh, to my heart as well. I know Scott Strode very well. He's a good friend of mine. Um, Evan already gave the background on him, but I also went to um, the gym in um, what they call Methadone Mile in Boston. Um, I lived there for a few months in 2017. I was like, I want to I go like mix it up with these folks and really understand the power of this model. And I went, I'll never forget, I got paired up with this guy, Jim, that was a, a Vietnam vet and um, that was, he told me his story, heroin addict, you know, dealing with uh, post-traumatic post, post stress. And um, he had only been there like a year, and this guy's working out, and he's running circles around me doing pull-ups and flips, and all that. like, what, like, where did, how did you get to where you are? He's like, I've worked out every day in this gym since they pulled me off the street. And he said, now, he's like, it didn't only really help me, now I'm so inspired with how this, this, uh, the power of community plus the power of um, exercise, what it's done for me. I basically pull people off the street um, that are you know, drug addicts and I pull them in. And so think about that, a guy like Jim, who is you know, basically, on, you know, in the, basically in the ditch, right? And he finds the power of this model and then sees what it does for him. And then he goes and he helps 20 other people. Right, and then the next guy, you know, Dave was there. He had a similar story. He's doing the same thing. He's going and recruiting people. So how, if one person gets inspired by this, how that can go to many really quick. And then that, that just, and then so that's what we're trying to do with the movement, Urban Specialist, Cafe Momentum. There's a lot of these different groups where ultimately the power of these ideas, and if you get a community around that, but then it's not just money, right? This is. It's capital, but it's, it's also about energy, it's network, it's, it's um, different value you can bring from what you've learned in business on how to help these organizations scale. If you get enough of, of the, those um, together, you can create a movement. So with the Phoenix, for example, when, when you met Scott, we had three gyms in Colorado, right? I think we're close to 70 gyms across the country, and we've got one in Wichita, and I'll, I'll finish with this because it's just another personal story for me. Um, the reason I decided to support in, in, um, in partnership with, with Tom, Six Meridian, and, uh, and many other um, great investors here in Wichita that got behind bringing the Phoenix to Wichita, one of the catalysts for that was um, several years ago, um, I had someone that was um, high on meth actually uh, crash through my gate. And my kid was running around, Charlie, my oldest son, uh, was, was running around in the backyard. This was like seven at night, and he was coming back into the house. This guy crashes through the gate, and he's going about 80 miles an hour, and the cops are like chasing him through my, uh, through my yard. And um, luckily, Charlie was smart enough to, uh, to run the other way and, and, and call me and everything, and he didn't panic. Um, but, uh, you know, it could have been a really, really bad scene, and, and an officer was injured um, on the property. It was a total mess. But once we learned the guy's story of what he'd, what he'd gone through, um, realized he had some really tough family situations. That was his, his first offense, um, and, uh, you know, um, over the course of his life. And there was a lot of things going on there. And, um, you know, we're asked, like, you know, are you going to press charges? You can put them away for whatever, seven, eight years. Like, I don't want to press charges on this guy. Like, and in, in a prior life, I would have said, yeah, it's like throw the book at him, right? You know, he could have really hurt someone in my family. But when you understand more where these people are, are coming from and you understand, like, uh, the power of a model like Phoenix where you can take a, a gentleman that, that did that and you can help him transform his life, um, that was kind of a catalyst for it. We need this right here in Wichita. Is there, there's, uh, I've seen the power of it in Boston and other markets as well. We need, we need, uh, we need this, this same offering yeah. uh, right here in our backyard. Well, I want to come back to the Phoenix because uh, I passed it on my way in uh, from the hotel this morning. Um, 
but Christina, I want to go to you now. So you're an incredible example of this social entrepreneurship that's happening from the bottom up here in Wichita. Uh, can you share a little bit about the Create campaign and how what you're doing is, is, uh, is furthering these principles and ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So again, thank you for having me as well. Just a real high level about who I am. I too, like Chase, I'm a Wichita native. I uh, grew up in neighborhoods where we didn't have to put our fingers in bullet hearts. We were on the floor uh, trying to protect ourselves from bullets. We did not get to play outside um, because it was just too dangerous. But I came from a home where my parents inspired a love of education, a love of learning. And even that violence in our neighborhood, it did not define the totality of our neighborhood. We had doctors, we had attorneys, we had business leaders, but we didn't know them as business leaders. We just knew them as people who we went to church with or people who were mentors to us or people who taught us in our school buildings. And so the idea of entrepreneurship wasn't really always discussed. It was go to school, make good grades and get a good job. Fast forward to which I did. I went to school, made good grades, and I got a great job because I was connected with the Wichita Eagle at a very early age. I was the cultural affairs reporter for the Wichita Eagle, covering Wichita's ethnic and minority communities as holistic communities. And in that, I was able to meet a group of minority contractors who were really working to get more equity in contracting here in Wichita. And so through that, they inspired again, a love of going and doing and building strong community. Fast forward beyond that, I had an opportunity to be invited to so join a group at the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce that was looking to activate entrepreneurship in Wichita and specifically wanted to look at how do we get more African Americans involved in our business community. And for me, I had gone through, again, the stories of telling their story. I also had launched a business and I had gone to service providers to help me as well grow my business to a different scale. And so I knew there was a disconnect if we could just bring folks together, the service professionals with the business owners, and give them not just business cards, but an app opportunity to connect, to interact, and to help them nurture that relationship to grow strong businesses, we'd be onto something. What started as a half-day event at Wichita State University in 2015, where we thought we'd just get 35 black entrepreneurs to come to the event, ended up with 77 coming to the event, and many of them calling me, asking me, how do I build a business from here? That grew. We knew one event, one time a year was not enough. In 2017, after growing our programming, we structured as a nonprofit. And the curious part about this journey is that in 2018, a commerce bank came to my nonprofit and asked if it would be okay if they gifted a building at 21st and Grove to serve as a headquarters for our nonprofit, not realizing I grew up six blocks away from that commerce bank. My family banked at that commerce bank. And to come back and renovate it into a entrepreneurial hub, providing resources, workshops, trainings, building a microloan fund to serve minority entrepreneurs and using those same contractors who I wrote about as a, as a journalist to do the work inside of the building. The story comes full circle. So where are we now? Thanks to connections with Rising Tide Capital, Stand Together, connections with Entrust Bank and others, we've been able to grow our nonprofits where I'm not just a volunteer CEO, we are now a staff of four. We have reached between 300 to 400 African-American and Hispanic Latino entrepreneurs serving all. We have markets in Kansas City, Kansas. We launched in Omaha. And now we are in um, the midst of a huge, expanse, huge expansion bringing Rising Tide Capital's entrepreneurship curriculum to Wichita. The difference, though, they said, with many of our organizations across the country, Wichita is the 10th city that's in their network, many of them did not have entrepreneurship curriculum. You all have done entrepreneurship. You have a microloan fund. You have investors like Jeff Turner, it's good to see you in the room, who's working with minority entrepreneurs. What more can we do? They help to anchor. They help to anchor our work. They help to be able to connect us to a national network more quickly than we could have done all by ourselves. And for that, we're grateful. So we're spinning out founders, and founders not just of Facebook storefronts, but founders who can be on the city's riverfront. Founders like Jennifer McDonald with Jenny Don Sellers, Mark Daniels, and Grace Freeman with the Wichita Cheesecake Company, not factory. We don't need a factory here. We've got a company, and many <laughs> others. So it is a beautiful thing to be at this intersection to bring service professionals together with entrepreneurs to build businesses at scale. Yes, from the bottom of the ground up, but I tell you, it takes all levels to get the work done. Yeah, that's fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> 
I'd, I'd love to follow up. This idea of entrepreneurship in particular, you, you know, a lot of philanthropists and nonprofit efforts, they don't start with something like entrepreneurship uh, because I think they probably don't believe in the people they're serving or capable of starting businesses and being these incredible business leaders. I, I know that you believe the exact opposite, but can you tell me a little bit about the power of entrepreneurship and the incredible ability and opportunity for the individuals you work with to be incredible business leaders? Absolutely. I always get the question, why the name Create Campaign? Why the name? That was our event name, uh, Create Campaign, and it grew into our organization name. Uh, we did that intentionally. We want to inspire creators. We don't just want to be consumers, and we have to instill the power that you have the opportunity when connected with the right information, the right resources, and a really dedicated work ethic. As an entrepreneur, you have to have that. Um, then you too can make it because on anybody's paper, I was no one's entrepreneur. I was just a journalist. And fast forward to again, the will to be able to solve a problem of providing strong communications around uh, communities of color that then led to opportunities to not only design for minority entrepreneurs, but to see there's gaps. If you don't have a business plan or direction, then you are missing your opportunity in business. So I just remember how people looked at me and, oh, she, that's good intentions, but they didn't necessarily always believe. But then you get around the right people. You get around the right resources who see the belief, who have helped me along my journey. You don't have to know it all, but you do have to be willing to learn. And now, being able not just to lead the Create campaign, but also to be at the tables writing policy that helps systemic changes around entrepreneurship. We're not talking about just a program around Black History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month. We are talking about changing people, policies, and practices to create sustainable opportunities for our entrepreneurs, and it is working. We are building an inclusive environment that has looked at the issues differently in order to solve problems in ways that stick and sustain. I'll give you one quick example, and that is access to capital. So many entrepreneurs, anyway, when you're a startup, access to traditional capital is risky. It, it absolutely is, and we recognize that. But if you do not have the credit profile to be able to enter into a relationship or enter into a pitch to get capital, then you're building with fewer resources through efforts and partnerships like with Aaron Bastion and with Fidelity Bank. And now it's gone on to interest bank. We've been able to build microloan programs for people who do not fit the traditional credit style. We have dropped the credit criteria 100 points. We have waived collateral requirements. We have kept interest rates low. And in doing so, between the now three, four uh, microloan programs I've been able to write, including the city of Wichita's program, we have done more than $281,000 um, in microloans since 2018, and it continues to build. In fact, we just went through another series of approvals, which will put us over 400,000 from people, who, again, who could not qualify. The goal is to make them bankable, and guess what? Not one has defaulted. We can do this. Wow, it's fantastic. Awesome. So Chase, I want to return to the, to the Phoenix for a second. Um, so as you mentioned, the Phoenix has just exploded all over the country. Um, recently, the, the federal bureaucracy called SAMHSA uh, that regulates the, that sort of provides grant programs and regulates addiction services, mental health services uh, for the federal government, they said, we've gotten it wrong, that uh, we thought there were 20 million Americans experiencing addiction in the country. We, can't, we counted wrong, it's actually 40 million, not 20 million. Uh, and that doesn't count the 20 million more, at least that we know of, that are actively in recovery already. So this is just this enormous problem, and we know in the pandemic, um, that it's gotten a whole lot worse. And the prevailing approaches in society are to throw people in prison for uh, drug and alcohol um, uh, offenses. We know that the top-down approaches are clinical treatment, which is often life-saving and important, but there's not enough clinical treatment beds in the country to even tackle a fraction of that problem, even if they were 100% effective, when we know that they're actually more like 40% at best or 15, 10% more likely for most clinical treatment services. Um, or just treating drugs with other drugs, right? Trying to medicate ourselves, uh, which again, saves lives, but doesn't actually solve the problem for the individual. So there's this just really critical need to grow efforts that can have this impact. Um, I'd love for you to both touch on uh, why you're so excited about the Phoenix's scale here in, in, um, in Wichita, but if I can also ask you about, you've been really passionate about music in particular and the opportunity of pairing 
uh, music with the Phoenix as a way to build it into an even larger movement? Yeah, well, um, it, music has always been a, um, I don't, just a passion of mine, all the way back to I was 11 or 12 years old. It's just been a part of my life. Actually, my first, my first business was uh, building car stereos out of my parents' garage with Askia Mod, who taught me how to be an, an audiophile, and that, it just always stuck with me, right? And and um, and so I, I've always thought about like what music has done for me, and like and also in connecting with other people. And there's this amazing power of music, people call it the universal, the universal language, right? And with the uh, divisiveness in our country and everything becoming so tribal and we, they, and all this mud casting, whether it's politically or whatever bucket you want, people want to put someone else in, I've, I've always felt like maybe um, music is one tool to actually help bridge divides. And um, so when, when COVID hit um, and everyone was you know, on lockdown, basically, um, everyone was trying to figure out, you know, okay, what can I do? And people were trying to, what, what can we do for even entertainment, right? And I was thinking about, um, I actually brainstormed with, with Omar Jawar from the Urban Specialist because I, he is very passionate about music. He had the same vision as I did, but we could never figure out how do you bring this power of music and combine that with the power of stand together and these ideas. So we said, let's launch, let's launch a virtual show. We'll call it Stand Together, Jam Together. And we'll take uh, some of the artists that he knows. I had one or two relationships that people would want to come on to Zoom and actually like see these artists perform. And we can align it around the issues that, that we actually have capability in. So criminal justice reform, equal rights, um, overcoming addiction, bottom-up solutions to poverty. And so we, we, we basically ran these experiments where uh, we had virtual concerts and we invited people from the Stand Together community in. Um, and on addiction, um, to your uh, question on, on, um, on the Phoenix, um, I knew uh, Matt Sorum, who is the drummer of Guns N' Roses through a, a prior uh, relationship. And um, he's, you know, he told me his story about battling addiction and, and he was 13 years sober. And, and, um, and he said, I'll come on and I'll, I'll tell my story. And um, you know, this is amazing what the Phoenix is doing. I wanna learn more about that and we'll get this community. So we had like five, 600 folks online and you've got um, Matt Sorum, you know, online. He's a drummer, but he can play guitar too. He's playing Patience, you know, one of their, one of their amazing songs. And you got all these people that are locked in their house going, this is unbelievable, right? And he's creating awareness. He's vulnerable. He's telling his story about what he went through and sharing it um, in, in a way that um, like most people hadn't heard before. And then you got Scott Strode that's sharing his story. And it's like, oh, by the way, let's just, let's just not talk about the problem. We have solution here. That Scott Strode and this model is taking off and it's working. And oh, by the way, in COVID, uh, addiction rates are skyrocketing, right? So let's, let's figure out what we can do. So anyway, that started as one experiment with one show and they're like, wow, we got um, amazing feedback that music, highly influential musicians want to tap into this because there's no other alternative. They, and I've talked to many musicians, they're like, we get asked to do these you know, pop-up shows, big concerts, it's kind of like, the, um, like the, the, those, that classic show in the 80s where they did the big uh, live aid on AIDS awareness or whatever. But they do the show and then the musicians are gone. And it's like, okay, what, what impact do we really have? We raise some money, but where's that gonna go? What we've learned from these, these influencers and musicians, they're like, you guys offer a partnership and a long term and you have capability and you actually care. Um, so that experiment from doing a virtual show has led to like, we've created this whole group. We've got a leader of Stand Together Music where we're just going out and trying to find influential folks. And we do this in sports too. You've been a great leader on this and Deion Sanders and other NFL players have, have, have been involved with this. But you think about our overall vision of creating a movement, either a local movement in Wichita a national movement around how to overcome an issue like addiction or new bottom-up solutions to poverty. Um, you've got to have, especially in the social media world that we live in, you've got to use those tools and partner with those tools to get these stories out there and that inspires others 
to really kind of to, to break through. So that's another reason, you know, I'm, I'm basically trying to leverage one of my passions and something that I'm really interested in to do good. And that's, that's one of the things that I've learned, at least about myself, is try to work on everything. You can't be effective, right? But pick that area that when you have your own story and um, you also like really kind of speaks to you in your heart and what you want to get involved with. And that it's been the combination of these bottom up community um, solutions like urban specialists and, and um, in the Phoenix and cafe momentum. And then it's like, okay, well, what if we can create a whole new model of yeah. bringing influence to that as well and supercharge it in a way that hasn't been done before. So that's, that's, um, yeah. and yeah, so we're trying on, on, on the Phoenix, we have a campaign now. It started with three gyms. It's called uh, One Million Strong, where we're trying to create a movement of a million people. And the ultimate vision, and we hope by 2025, that the Phoenix can become really the standard of care for addiction. And it all started with one guy, Scott Strode. You know, so I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting when you yeah. can see this and just take off in, in a short period of time like that. Yeah, we helped the Phoenix build a technology platform so that anyone anywhere can join the Phoenix community and participate in virtual programming and engage in community on the app and then also launch volunteer-led programming in their community. So in addition to the communities where we have gyms and people can show up and climb the climbing wall like I did, there's this opportunity to get the real magic of the Phoenix, which is not the physical fitness, it's the peer-to-peer -peer network and the pride and self-actualization that happens from being in recovery and helping others to recover, not sort of in the deficiency mindset of some other programs, good ones like 12-step and what have you, that make it a, that sort of might foster a deficiency mindset of being broken in your addiction. Instead, this pride in recovery um, it's an incredible opportunity to reach a million people over the next few years, and we've got some really exciting stuff cooking with some major musicians and influencers uh, for the One Million Strong campaign, hopefully recovery month in September. Last question for both of you guys, uh, and then I'll wrap us up with a few next steps. Um, Christina, I'd love to come to you first. Um, obviously, one way that everyone can practice the principles and philosophy that we've been talking about today is to support the Create campaign and get involved in the Create campaign. I'd love for you to share some of those things. But also, what broader advice do you have that if it's not working directly with you, what, what would you hope to see mm -hmm. this group of influencers and investors and business leaders take away from our time today? Absolutely. Um, I just have a sincere appreciation for partnerships and relationships. And so Six Meridian didn't necessarily know us as deeply as maybe those we've been serving since 2015, but when they heard about the opportunity because of the introduction, they gave us a go and they supported. So Tom and Margaret, thank you for that. Um, taking a good and informed risk to do things differently is not a bad thing. It's called an experiment. And we need more people to experiment. We need more people to experiment around quality programs that can really make a difference because, again, they're not just programs. They're changing systems, not just um, point-in-time moments. And so take some experiments. Get involved with some experiments to truly change, again, what can happen in the trajectory of people's lives. How many of you all have had moments in your life where you're like, somebody made a strong difference, a real difference, in my life, just by a nod of heads. This is everyone in this room. Getting involved in entrepreneurship and getting involved in, again, those opportunities to change the course of people's lives systemically, that can happen. It can happen with your treasure, your investments, again, that help the capacity of our organization to, to do more quickly, but it can also happen with you sharing your expertise, sharing your subject matter, uh, sharing your networks of influence, sharing, listening, helping, getting involved, partnering, being a real, again, connector and friend in this work. So I appreciate the opportunity to share just a few ways. In terms of Create Campaign, we're almost done with our expansion uh, raise. Let me just share um, 1.2 million for an organization that had a $25,000 budget. That's a large leap, right? That's awesome. But again, through connections and connectors, we've had four corporate sponsors and to create campaigners who it was a sacrifice to their households to give. We've crossed over the $861,000 mark in a matter of months. 
Phoebe, thank you for the introductions. We've got that little left to raise, and that will get us to three years. But someone had said, and I'll, I'll pause with this, with Stand Together, Christina, your organization and organizations like yours, you're used to moving lean. Lean is fine, but what could you do with the resources to move at scale? You all, I'm excited to move at scale. So thank you for having me to share that with you all. Awesome. So you just have a couple minutes. What advice? What's the one takeaway you, you know, share It's with hard you? to follow Christina on that. Yeah, um, it is. She, uh, her point on experimentation, I, that, that resonates with me as well. And um, I mean, I, I hope you can see like my passion for the things that I get to work on um, as well. And it's because I did what Christina said and I experimented. I was like, what are the things that I really care about? Um, where I'm going to take you know, a time that I value away from my family or business or whatever, and I'm going to invest it um, towards. And, and so that's how it was around the Phoenix. It was around Cafe Momentum, mm -hmm. Urban Specialist. It's just something about that resonated with me because I went out and I, I saw like, in, in the neighborhoods like what was going on. Um, and so I spent the time to do that. And then it developed, you know, my, my own passion where kind of my heart and soul was like invested in it. Um, and uh, what, what I would say is that this is, you know, you do it because you can help other people. But I would say there's so much mutual benefit in getting more involved and that it has transformed my life and mm -hmm. in, in, in being involved in this. And um, so I, I just think I, I want that for everyone. Right, have that same experience, that same feeling of when you find that one thing or two things or whatever it is, it's like it just you become obsessed, uh, you know, about yeah. it, and you you really want to dig in and invest your time, and you lay awake thinking about it, what what you can do um, on the margin to really help um, whatever issue it is that, that you care most about. So I'm just I'm, you know just following what Christine is saying here. Yeah, well, on your table is a, uh, is a QR code. If you're interested in learning more about the specific efforts of the Create Campaign, of the Phoenix, of Safe Families for Children, or the Wichita Social Entrepreneurship Program, and the folks that we've uh, selected will be making some of those announcements real soon, I'd love for you to scan that QR code. Oh. If you're old fashioned and want the, uh, the actual hard copies, uh, Phoebe Bakura from our team over here uh, has those and would love to connect. Uh, come grab me, Phoebe, uh, Chase, and Christina. We would love to partner together, uh, whether it's on the direct efforts or if it's just to help you think about how to change your mindset in this work so that you can be an agent of disruption and change and have that courage to think different, differently about philanthropy. Um, we'd love to do it. So a, a big thank you to our panelists, and thank you for your time today. We appreciate it.